M&M's lab, and um, we want to do this thing called a chi-squared goodness of fit, not a chi, like the hair product, okay? It is a Greek letter, chi-squared, and so capital X, and it'll be, we'll be squaring it to get that component. And so what happens is, say we want to determine the true proportion of each color of M&M's, all of them, all six colors, the proportions of all six of those. So if we have a bag of M&Ms, which you're going to get your own sample of M&Ms, um, and you want to make a statement about that true proportion, can we do that? And we can make a statement, but it is limited. Okay? We cannot exactly say how much of each one there is, or even which ones are off by how much. Okay? Uh, we will get some numbers that indicate that but we'll make a collective statement about all of the proportions together. For example, the Mars Company claims that each color of the regular M&Ms are these particular percentages, 13% brown, 14% yellow, and so on. So we want to see if their claim is true collectively for all of those colors. So look at how our null hypothesis is stated. It's not a, it's not a Greek letter equals a number. It's actually out all in words that all the colors in the M&M's bag are distributed as stated. And so I just say that to be the shortcut of all of those percentages so I don't have to write them out. And then the alternative is that the um, all the colors in the M&M's bag are not distributed as stated. Okay? So that seems pretty much like we've been doing. We say we got what they got unless we have evidence against it. All right. So that doesn't sound too different from what we have already done. The difference is that this is a statement about all six colors, okay, that at one time. So the way that we do that is this thing called a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And, you know, grammar aside, we're seeing how good our sample fits what they say it is supposed to be, okay? So how good our sample fits what they say it's going to be. We're going to test whether the distribution of the counts that we got of one particular variable. What's our particular variable that we're going to be doing with our M&Ms? What's the variable that we're going to be doing with our M&Ms? Color. color. Thank you. Very good. Okay. So our, color, our variable for our M&Ms is our color. Um, and we want to see if that matches the distribution predicted, basically what they claim, okay, by the model. All right. So there are assumptions and conditions. Let's talk about what they are and specifically what's different than anything that we have done before. So here we go. Um, we actually are going to be dealing with the actual counts of items, not their percentages. So when we deal with things, um, do these in terms of counts, not percentages. So we know we want to have random selection. They're independent members of each other. Sample is size is less than 10% of the population size. Okay. Here is the main difference than any others. It's the large enough condition. For means, it's 30. For proportions, it's 10 successes and 10 failures. For this, it's that the expected counts are greater than five. So let's look at my sample data. I actually a few years ago got out a bag of M&Ms and here's what my data was. I had 60 M&Ms. These are the particular counts I had. So look at how I got my expected values. I did, they said 13% brown, so I do 13% of my 60 M&Ms means I should get 7.8 brown M&Ms. Okay, it needs to be the percent times the total in your sample is the amount that you expect. Now, is it okay for me to say I expect 7.8 brown M&Ms? Why? Okay, it's, a whole no it's not a whole number. However, these are expected. These decimals are okay because It is what is expected on average. 
it is what is expected on average. Meaning, if um, I collected a whole bunch of samples of size 60, you got a cup of 60 M&Ms, and you got a cup of 60 M&Ms, and you got a cup of 60 M&Ms, then the average of y'all's, you know, on average, y'all would get 7.8 brown M&Ms in your samples of 60 M&Ms, okay? Because those are what you expect on average. Now, we're going to talk about the formula and these components and this chi-squared number here shortly, but we're going to go ahead and collect data now. So if you go over to the end of the notes, about three pages over, you will have your own little um, table that you're going to put your data in. Okay, so find your own little table here. So I'm going to give you, you are going to get to choose regular or peanut M&Ms or peanut butter M&Ms. So what you're going to do whenever I let you go and do this, you're going to just fill in two of these columns. I want you to count your totals or count your amounts and then get the expected values. Okay, now let's recall how to get this expected value. This expected value takes your total M&Ms, your N, and multiplies it by the proportion that is claimed. Okay? So you will use this number here, total M&Ms times the proportion that is claimed. And whenever we get going, I will put these total, um, these are the ones that the M&Ms company gave me for regular peanut and peanut butter. These are the expected Okay, percentages, and so you'll multiply these percentages by your sample size to get how many you expect of each color. All right, one last thing before I let you get your M&Ms. Um, if you choose regular M&Ms, that's fine. You will have enough in your sample, but if you choose peanut or peanut butter because they are larger um, pieces of candy, it takes two cupfuls to equal a large enough sample size um, to be large enough expected values, okay? That means that you and a person have to, call, you know, put your samples together. So if you want peanut or peanut butter M&Ms, then you have to find a partner, and y'all will collectively do your cup together to get your sample size. All right, so I'm going to call you down to come and get your M&Ms, when you get them, what are you going to do? Count and expected value. Once you have done that, you may eat them. All right, guys. Okay, now that you have gotten your observed counts and your expected counts, see, these are what were observed. We need to get a reference of how far those were, the observed were away from expected. Okay, so there's this way that we do this. There is a chi-squared formula that will reference that difference in terms of um, the expected, not because we don't really have a standard deviation here. So on the AP statistics formula chart, um, this is the front, and you know we don't do much on the left side. We've worked our way through probability and binomial stuff. And then on the back, we've done our um, test statistic and our confidence interval. We've done these standard deviations. We haven't really done much of this two-tail stuff. But look, we are to the very last thing on the bottom of the back. And that means this is the last thing on the formula chart that we will be learning. And so we are, you know, starting to get to the end of things here. So what we do is to find one little component so we'll find a discrepancy for each color. So we will see how far the observed count is away from expected, and we don't want those to cancel out with each other, so we square those, quantity squared, and we do that in terms of expected. So for each color, you will do observed minus expected quantity squared divided by that expected value. That's for one component. Then, 
to get the entire chi-squared test statistic, what am I going to do with all six of those components? What's this symbol? Sum them up. Okay. So that means I'm going to do the formula. So I'm going to do my observed minus my expected quantity squared divided by expected, and I get that particular color's component or discrepancy. And so I'm going to do that for all six colors and then sum those up to get the total chi-squared value. All right, let me give you a few moments to do that, and then we'll have a discussion about your numbers. Okay, so one thing that you guys are wondering, and you keep asking me, you know, you're getting a number, and you're like, whoa, is this a big number? Whoa, I got a way big number, that kind of thing. And so we want to know what values make something that's incredibly strange. Well, on the normal curve, what kind of values would we get that we knew was strange? On the normal, greater than two standard deviations away. However, a chi-squared curve is not normally shaped and it's not even close. So let's first, before we figure out if your number down here is quote unquote strange or not, let's take a look, let's go to the next page and look at the shape of these chi-squared curves. So what happens is to get this, the area under the curve is still 100%, but look, these curves are not even close to normal. They are chi-squared, so they're all positive values. They are very skewed to the right, okay? Very skewed to the right. And they do have the degree of freedom uh, aspect to them as well. As these degrees of freedom increase, you can see that we kind of start changing the shape of these chi-squared curves, they actually do start getting a little bit more symmetrical. I don't know if they ever actually reach the normal curve. Um, well, in fact, I know they can't because the normal curve has the negatives and the positives and isn't just all positive, okay? But they do start becoming a little bit more symmetrical and not quite as skewed. So as degrees of freedom goes up, so as degrees of freedom increase, the chi-squared curve becomes more symmetric, okay, and not as skewed right. All right, now let's talk about those um, degrees of freedom. Just like the T distributions, they are N minus 1, but this is a big deal. The N is not the number of M&Ms. It's not your 80 M&Ms or your 52 M&Ms or your 60 M&Ms or whatever. N is not the number of M&Ms. It is the number of categories that we all had. And how many categories did we all have regardless of our number of M&Ms? We had six colors. Colors. So that made our degrees of freedom for every single one of us in this class even though we had different amounts of M&Ms, all of our degrees of freedom are five. Now, I've got on your desk that tan um, card that has this. It's got T curves on one side and chi-squared curves on the other. So go to the side that has the chi-squared curves. Now, what happens if you have a very small chi-squared number? If... Look here. What happens if my component happened to be zero? What would a component of zero mean? That I what? Yeah, no difference. Good. Then a component of zero would mean that this color, got I got exactly what was expected. So the closer you are to zero, look at this one, 0 0.0111, because I got 14 and 14.4 was expected, so I pretty much got as close as I could for that one. The closer you are to zero, the closer you are to what was expected. And what's the opposite of that? Of course, the bigger your numbers, the farther you are away from what was expected. So when we go and look at this, these ones here, chi-squared numbers down here, means you got 
what was expected. Okay, and then the further you go out this way, these are your p-values, the probability of getting that sample or something more extreme if the null is true. Okay, so there's your p-values. So let's take a look at your chart. Um, and we need, this is the only chart that I do force you to know how to use because there is a function that the calculator does not do. It's the inverse chi-squared. So if you need to, if you're given an area and you need to know the chi-squared value, then the calculator can't give that to you. So this is the only chart that the calculator can't give you stuff for and you need to have that. You have that? Cool. So, okay, let's go then and look at, all of us look at degrees of freedom of 5. Okay, degrees of freedom of 5. My chi-squared number was like 3.15. I'm not even on the chart. So, mine, my p-value, here are the p-values up here at the top, okay? My p-value is bigger than 0.25. Okay, let's talk about what's unusual. Where would I start rejecting our null hypothesis? What kind of p-values would I start rejecting? Okay, at my 0.05, so here's my 0.05. Go down here. That's a chi-squared value of 11.07 or higher. So all of you who got a chi-squared number of 11.07 or higher, you rejected the null hypothesis. If yours was less than that, then it wasn't too freaky. Okay, how many of y'all reject? How many of you? One. See? Oh, two? Two groups? Oh, okay. No. So, one group. And do reject? Oh, two? Y'all, okay. Oh, just barely. Yeah. Okay, so we had two groups. One of them was just barely. So that's interesting. What if the null hypothesis is true. And Bryn's group happened to get a sample that was unusual, but they got it, and it rejected the null hypothesis. What is that? Type 1 error. Good. Because we just had one that had an unusual sample to reject it. That one could have been a type 1 error. All right. So, um, although this chart, you know, is nice and could help us find our chi inverse chi-squared values, um, let's get it more exact by using our calculator. So let's do this on your table. I have information down here at the bottom that tells you how to do this in your calculator. So we're going to go in here and we're going to put your observed into list one and your um, expected into list two. So go and put your observed into list one and you're expected into list two. Do that now. So after you have your observed and your expected in there, we're going to go stat over to tests. And I like to go up to get to the bottom of the list. By the way, the first one on the bottom of the list is ANOVA. That is multiple means and uh, you know analysis of, of all the variable variances that are going on, multiple variances, we won't ever do that. That's the next thing you would do after this class. Okay, Two sample F tests we will also not do, um, but the others we will. We want chi-squared GOF test. Not just chi-squared test, but chi-squared GOF. So we hit enter, our observed and expected. Make sure your degrees of freedom say five and then calculate, and that will then give you your chi-squared number. You can check. That will give your p-value, but look at these CNTRB. Let's look at what those things, CNTRB. I'm going to hit, so it's this, for me, it's 0.18, a bunch of decimals, and then a space, and then a bunch more decimals. You know what each one of those things are? Those should look familiar to you when you look at yours. Those or your individual components. That's what they should look like, be. They are your individual components. So all of that stuff can be done then there in your calculator. Okay? So we're seeing the discrepancy for one of those and then totaling that up. So in summary, in summary, our chi-square test is going to give us this discrepancy for multiple proportions. 
not just one, not just two, multiple proportions. We will be summing up all of those individual discrepancies to get a total chi-squared value. Okay. Um, additionally, your chi-squared curve does not look like a normal curve. It's all positive values. It is skewed to the right. Okay, your chi-squared curve is skewed to the right. So to get that p-value, it is always an upper tail, by the way. Um, and your degrees of freedom, here's the things. Degrees of freedom are no are n minus 1, but what is n? Categories, not the number in your sample. And what is the large enough condition for this test? That the expected values are greater than 5. The expected values are greater than 5. Okay. So I think that sums up what we're going to do for chi-squared goodness of fit. And we actually don't have homework, but we'll do add to that tomorrow. Okay, we'll do some assignment on that tomorrow.